Buenas tardes, bienvenidos una vez más a Casa Árabe. Hoy me complace inaugurar la mesa redonda que organizan Casa Árabe y la Embajada. El panel organizado por la Casa Árabe y la Embajada de la Slovaquia República en Slovaquia, Slovaquia Republic en España. Within the framework of uh, the, uh, with the cooperation with of Nuria Martinez de Castilla, specialist in codicology and history of uh, Islamic world manuscripts, the panel will be devoted to uh, talk about the different trips and journeys followed by the Arabic and Islamic manuscripts until they uh, were gathered in different collections and files in European libraries. It will, we, will deal, we will talk in particular about three collections, the Basajic collection from the University Library in Bratislava, whose ambassador from Slovakia is present here with us today, and the Arabic manuscripts in the library in the University Library from Leiden in Holland and the collection of Arabic manuscripts in the El Escorial Monastery. We will also talk about the common issues found when tracing the history of the Islamic manuscripts in Europe. For this, we have here today three experts in each of these fields. Clara Mesarosova from the University Arnold Library in Bratislava, Arnold Bolek, curator from the Leiden University Library, and Nuria Martinez de Castilla from the Complutense University in Madrid, moderated by Marek Briasca, a deputy head from the Slovakia Embassy in Spain. Before uh, this debate, we will have the opportunity of watching a brief documentary on the Besajic collection of Islamic manuscripts, which is part of the memory of the World Register of the UNESCO that will um, exhibit the history of such a collection. I will leave the floor to Mr. Vladimir Gras, the ambassador of Slovakia and Madrid, who will be followed by Silvia Staselova, General Director of the University Library of Bratislava, and I would like to thank them both for being here today with us. Mr. Ambassador, I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you very much. Um, to all present here, if you allow me, I will set a bridge between Spanish and English, and I will uh, say my speech in English. Um, first of all, let me express my gratitude towards uh, Casa Arabe and uh, the University Library in Bratislava uh, that have made this uh, cultural project possible. It is a great honor for me to present here tonight the roundtable and debate about Islamic uh, manuscripts in Europe. Maybe never before in human history, the acknowledgement and acceptance of other cultures was more urgent and pressing as it is now, during the tumultuous period of the contemporary history of Europe, which very bases have been shaken by the recent events and crisis. We are even speaking about an existential crisis. As you know, during the second half of this year, Slovakia exercises its first historical presidency in the Council of the Union, uh, European Union. We have inherited many challenges that shape the world today, and especially the EU. Our presidency is slowly coming to its end, and uh, I have to admit that uh, I am very proud, looking back at the previous uh, months of our activities. It uh, does not sound very modest, but uh, I dare to say that uh, we have been doing this job very well. But uh, let me now dwell too much uh, on politics uh, that can sometimes antagonize too much, and let me concentrate more on uh, culture and, and philosophy. Culture humanizes, brings people together, and acts a very powerful, as a very powerful instrument in eradicating fear of the so-called unknown. I often tend to say that the work of diplomacy is such an uh, undertaking. Diplomats can be perceived as modern cultural engineers who build bridges 
that in turn connect people to people, knowledge of the other and uh, cultivating understanding is what I consider proper for the cultural diplomacy. Slovakia is a young country, but an old nation situated in the very heart of Europe. As everyone knows, a heart can be a dangerous place. Nevertheless, we Slovaks are known for our peaceful nature. Maybe this was one of the reasons Safed Bek Basagic was considering when he decided in 1924 to sell his collection to the university library in Bratislava explaining his decision as an effort to transfer the precious collections to a safe place. I consider Spain, taking into a consideration its long and rich history, a very adequate place to organize such an event involving the talk about Bashagic collection. About Spain's capital, Madrid, many speculate that its name has an Arabic origin derived from al Majrit. Another great example of its rich cultural history could be Al-Andalus during its apogee. At the time, many people, at the time, many people perceived it as such safe, uh, it's such safe place and a model of so-called convivencia between various peoples of different religions, creeds, and cultural codes. Therefore, it is a great honor for me to have this opportunity tonight to present here the event that we called Su Corazon and Tus Manos. As the title suggests, manuscripts require special care, special affection that displayed not only its proper authors, but also those who carefully preserved them throughout the centuries. Without their attentive care and affection, works of great poets, philosophers, and scientists would have been lost forever. Despite everything, this legacy continues and manuscripts are being studied, analyzed, and taken care of. I am very happy to welcome among us our experts who continue this venerable tradition, Mrs. Mesaroshova from the University Library of Bratislava, uh, along with the General Director of the University <coughs> Library, Silvia Staselova, from the Netherlands came Mr. Arnold Roek, curator of uh, Oriental Manuscripts and Rare Books of Leiden, at Leiden University Libraries, and Spanish expert from Complutense University, Mrs. Uh, Nuria Martinez de Castilla. These speakers will talk tonight not only about the collections, its various and zigzag roads, but also about methods, how to preserve them. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. And now I would like to give the floor to Madame Silvia Staselova, the General Director of the University Library in, in Bratislava, to tell us a few words about the library and the Bashagish collection. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, dear ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor and pleasure to warmly welcome you at uh, today's important event on behalf of the University Library in Bratislava, uh, the largest and oldest research library in Slovakia. Our library has a rich nearly 100 year tradition in supporting education, research and culture in our country. Since its foundation in 1919, it has been a major influence on generations of our leading scientists, teachers and writers and other personalities in the social and cultural life of Slovakia. The University Library in Bratislava occupies three historical buildings, which underwent major reconstruction work 10 years ago to create a modern library and cultural center equipped with the latest information technology and providing a wide range of library and information services. Our library's collections include nearly three million documents, the oldest of which date from the 12th century. There are also 450 incunabula in the collection and many other rare books from all over the world. The University Library in Bratislava has always been the flagship of Slovak librarianship. We are proud to say that our library has a long history of cooperating with the United Nations. In October 1947, 
at the proposal of the Czechoslovak government in that time, the university library in Bratislava became a United Nations depository library, and in 1957, an official document was signed establishing the UNESCO depository library. In 1994, a UNESCO center was established in our library, which is the only information and documentation center for the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization in the Slovak Republic. The UNESCO Center also serves as the Secretariat of the Slovak Committee for the UNESCO program Memory of the World. Since the year 2000, the register of this program has included the Bashagic collection, a collection of Arabic, Turkish, and Persian manuscripts that, that University Library in Bratislava acquired for its collections, just five years after its foundation in 1924. The Bashagic collection includes the most important works of medieval Islamic scientific and artistic literature. We take exemplary care of this Bashagic collection. Between 2007 and 2011, the whole collection was digitized and the staff of our library take the greatest care to preserve the wealth of this cultural treasure for people who are interested in it, wherever they are in the world, and also for the future generations. The Bashagic collection uh, brings a great interest of researchers, scholars, and also politicians all over the world. Among them, I would like to highlight one of the most important visitors in our library, who came to see the unique Bashagic collection in October 2015. It was the United Nations Secretary General, His Excellency Ban Ki-moon, who visited U University Library in Bratislava. Immediately after his visit, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA, gave a large attention to this extraordinary visit of the United Nations highest representative interested in the special care of Islamic cultural heritage and its care by the library located in the middle of Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our great honor to have a chance to present our exceptional Bashagic collection today and also since tomorrow in Granada uh, where it will be uh, a special exhibition held until the end of this year. At the very end, my greatest thanks go to His Excellency Mr. Graz, uh, Slovak ambassador in Madrid and his close colleague Mr. Brieszka for organizing today's special occasion on Islamic manuscripts in European libraries and archives, and my greatest thanks to Casa Arabe for hosting us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for um, your contributions. We will see the documentary that I understand is going to be very interesting as well. Slovakia, Bratislava is today a center of political and economic life. Since its establishment, it has been a multilingual city famous for its tolerant coexistence of different nations and cultures. There are thousands of domestic as well as foreign students studying in Bratislava, often called the city of schools. The cultural profile of the city is full of theaters, museums, and galleries. For almost 90 years, the University Library has been one of the most important stands of culture in a city, the oldest scientific library in Slovakia. Some of its collections have been around since the 15th century. Today it has more than 2.5 million book units and it is the most visited library in the country.
It is located in three historical buildings in which, in addition to the traditional library activities, the most advanced technologies have also been applied to the processing of documents, digitalization of the most valuable collections and services to users. The most valuable documents are stored in a cabinet of manuscripts, old and valuable prints. In addition to manuscripts and prints of European origin, there is also, although not numerous, a rare collection of Arabic, Persian and Turkish manuscripts and prints. The University Library obtained this collection by purchasing it in 1924 in Sarajevo, Bosnia. Since the 15th century, Bosnia has been one of the European centers of Islamic culture. Originally, the collection of Islamic manuscripts and prints had been part of the collection of a family library established by one of the last Bosnian poets writing in Arabic, Ibrahim Bashagic, during the second half of the 19th century. His son, Safed Beg Bashagic, had continued the collection. He studied Oriental science and was an acknowledged literate translator, director of the National Museum, and for several election terms he held the position of deputy chairman of the Bosnian parliament. Under pressure by the change in the political situation in Bosnia, he decided to sell his family library in order to preserve it and move it to safety. Bashagic's library includes almost 600 titles of manuscripts and 500 titles of prints. The importance of this little Islamic library lies in the fact that it was created in a European environment. It reflects the Yugoslavian Muslim culture of several centuries. It includes scholarly works and bell letters in Arabic, Persian and Turkish, but also Bosnian texts written using Arabic letters. The oldest manuscript in the collection is an ethnic work by Al Isbahani, transcribed in 591 Hira, i.e. in the period 1194-95. The most precious Kaimilia include the manuscript of works of the second teacher of Al-Farabi, Kitab Fimantik. Our volume includes 12 studies, eight of which had not been preserved in any other place. Most of the studies deal with logic, others are devoted to the categories of analytics, topics, rhetoric and poetry. The manuscript comes from 1116 Hira, i.e. from 1704-1705. The code from the 16th century includes 47 works of poetry and mystic essays by the following poets. Abdurrahman Gami, Galaluddin Rumi, Aziz Nasafi, Riyazi Samarkandi, and selected chapters by Sadiq Gulistan and Bustan. This code also includes 372 Roubaix by Omar Khayyam. This is the largest number of quatrains preserved in a single manuscript. The most beautiful manuscripts in the collection include the Book of Prayer by al Ghazuli, Dalal al Hayrat. The oldest of the Turkish codes is Alexander's book, the Stani Iskendername by Ahmedi, a transcription from 1846. It is an epic about the life and adventures of Alexander the Great, but the poet has also presented his encyclopedic knowledge and reflects the historical events of his era.
supplemented and donated to the Sultan Murad III. A collection of poems transcribed in the 19th century include in addition to Arabic and Turkish also Serbian and Croatian poems written using Arabic letters. The Prince is the book by Katib Celebi. Tuhfet ul Kibar, Fi Esfar il Bihar, The Gift to the Great Ones on Naval Campaigns. It was published as the second printed book in Istanbul in 17. Moscow appreciated the uniqueness of the collection of Islamic manuscripts of the Bashagic Library and in 2000 it included it in the Memory of the World Registry. Good evening, everybody, excellencies, uh, all lovers of uh, Islamic culture and especially of uh, Islamic manuscripts and builders of cultural bridges. Let me welcome you uh, at this event tonight. My name is Marek Bryska. I'm the uh, deputy head of mission of the Slovak Republic in, uh, in Madrid. And I'm going to be moderating uh, tonight the round table about uh, Islamic manuscripts in Europe. First, let me tell you a couple of words about our speakers tonight. On the right hand side, we have uh, Nuria Martinez de Castilla. She's an expert on Islamic manuscripts and uh, at the same time, she's professor at the Department of uh, Islamic and Arabic uh, History at Complutense uh, in Madrid. But as she told me recently, she obtained a post in, uh, in Paris uh, where she's gonna be studying codico codicology. So not only this, in her career, she started a course, which is annual course on uh, Manuscritos and Islam, it was taught and uh, also various experts were invited. Thank you, Nuria. Uh, on my left hand side, we have uh, Mr. Arnold Frolik, if I pronounce it well. Yeah. yeah. And uh, since 2006, he, he's been creator of uh, Oriental Manuscripts and Rare Books at the University of, uh, of Leiden. And uh, since 2009, uh, he has been editor of monograph series, Islamic uh, Manuscripts and Book, published by very uh, professional, very important Brill in Leiden. Expensive. And expensive, I would say. Yeah, I, I know the <laughs> publishing house. Perfect. And uh, on my right-hand side, we have uh, Mrs. Clara Mesarosova. Uh, you have seen um, the movie. It's, it's awesome. She was the force behind and the motor behind um, this movie. And she, she's the head of department of uh, manuscripts and rare books at the library, or at the university, university library in Bratislava. And she has been taking care of this collection for more than 20 years, preserving it to its uh, perfect state as we, can, uh, we, can, we could have seen. So uh, without going into much details, I would give floor to our speakers, so let's begin with uh, Mrs. Clara Mesarosheva first. You have a floor, thank you. Excellent. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I feel greatly honored uh, to have the opportunity uh, to introduce to you one of the most peculiar multicultural uh, funds deposited in the University Library in Bratislava. The University Library uh, was established in a research library in 1919, bringing together a number of older libraries with roots going back to the 16th century. The library's funds represent to European culture of the book, a trove manuscripts and printed docu documents from the 12th century to the, to the present. Uh, <clears throat> with uh, priority being given to books produced in Slovakia. Uh, it's the only library in Slovakia to receive legal deposit of works size its found foundation, which means uh, that alongside its library services, it uh, function functions at uh, conservation's library. The university library currently holds around 2.5 million library, uh, million books, uh, document library documents, which make it one of the largest libraries in the country. Visitors number are around 200,000 per year, including readers, users of electronic services and participants in events. The library operates in a number of historic buildings in the center of Bratislava. Uh, the library also acquired documents with cultural connections or outside uh, to Euro European space, a noteworthy example being the collection of the Arabic, Turkish, and Persian manuscripts and printed works in the Bashagic collection. The Bazhevich collection was established in the Balkans and docu documents uh, the reception use and enhancement, enhancement of the cultural heritage of Islam in Europe. It includes manuscripts and printed works whose place of origin and country, uh, contents and the place of births uh, of the authors are distributed across a large part of the world. The collection is currently the subject of intense interest from researchers in Slovakia and other countries. The University Library purchased what, uh, what began as a private collection in uh, 1924 from the important Bosnian collector, Safed Bekbašagic. It originated in the family of a notable Bosnian intellectual living on the, on the to, uh, at the turn of the 19th and uh, 20th centuries. Dr. Safed Bekbašagic was a patriot poet, scholar, journalist, and politician. Both from his paternal and maternal lineages, he was a descendant of two prominent Muslim families, uh, the Bashagits and the Cengins, who had a great influence upon the political and cultural developments in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Bashagic inherited around a third of his collection from his father. He booked the <clears throat> remainder of the manuscripts and prints over a 30-year peri period, visiting all parts of the former Yugoslavia and also corresponding with antique book dealers and publishers throughout Europe and Asia. He was particularly <clears throat> interested in South Slavic writers and so to build up and preserve a picture of the South Slavic Muslim culture in uh, previous centuries. <clears throat> For this reason, the collection includes, alongside the classics of Islamic religious and scientific literature, prose and poetry, a large number of Bosniak, Serb, Croat, and Turkish writers writing in Arabic or using their native language written in Arabic script. Even today, 
Basha Gitz systematic approach to collecting is not fully appreciated. It uh, could be said that they saved many rare manuscripts in the last moment because at the end of the 19th century, manuscript culture in Bosnia was being rapidly replaced by the printed word. Bashagic entered into <coughs> negotiations with uh, poten uh, potential buyers for his rare collection in 1923, so that, as he himself put it, he could get it to safety. In the end, the collection found it, its way to the University Library in Bratislava, where it has received exemplary protection. The collection contains 393 Arabic, 117 Turkish and 1888 Persian manuscripts dating back to the uh, 12th to uh, 19th century. The prints contains 145 Arabic, 337 Turkish and eight Persian books to the dating back to uh, 18th to the uh, 20th century. <clears throat> Most of the works in the collection are re religious in nature, Korans, commentaries, traditions, religious law, dogmatic theology, mysticism, and prayers. There are also works of philosophy, metaphysics, logics, and psychology. Uh, other areas of knowledge that are represented include astronomy, mathematics, politics, administration, law, history, lexicography, grammar, prosody, rhetorics, and poetics. There is artistic literature in both poetry and prose and other works of human creativity. The manuscripts include various administrative files, notes, commentaries, and glosses. The manuscript collection includes original works written by authors in their own hand, the autographs, and also copies mostly made by professional scribes. Beside the common works, which can be found in many libraries. The Bashagic collection includes many unique works, noteworthy early copies and manuscripts with uncommonly pretty illustrations. A description of the whole manuscripts collection can be found at library website and therefore only a few interesting exemplars will be given here. The oldest manuscript uh, in the collection is a copy of work of ethics, Kitab uh, Daria by Arajid Alisbafani, uh, which were transcribed in the years 1194 uh, or 95. The most precious uh, item is the in the Bashakis collection is a collection of works by uh, Al Farabi. Kitab Film Antique. It includes 12 studies by Al Farabi, of which eight have survived only in this volume, making it an exceptionally valuable, unique research. The text is a transcript made in the years 1704 or 05. Uh, this manuscript was uh, publicated by, by uh, Lankhead and Grinaski in uh, 1975, uh, An interesting exemplar of the ways in which culture and language is mixed and interact is the collection which Bashagic named Metzmu a Ilahiyat, it's a collection of, uh, of Pio's uh, songs, which brings together religious poems by Bosnian folk artist, the Vishis, 
who wrote poems in the Slavic Bosnian language using Arabic script. The print works are very diverse. They include religious works, commentaries on the Quran, many works on tradi traditions, hajit, religious law, fiqh, uh, dogma, mysticism, ethics, liturgical topics, prayer books, and textbooks. Artistic literature is mainly traditional Muslim literature, but there are some translations into Turkish of English and French, French literature. For the first time, the Bashagic collection uh, has been processed by the collector himself, size uh, 1924, uh, when the University Library acquired the collection, the manuscripts and prints have been professional processed by several librarians and catalogs have been released. The collection is completely restored. In uh, 19... Uh, 61, the University Library published uh, the comprehensive catalog of this manuscripts collection. A uh, list of oriental prints came out in uh, 1980. Recently, an electronic bibliography with digitized images of individual manuscripts was produced by the library, which can be assessed on the library website and it's also available on CD. At present, Islamic manuscripts of the Bashagic collection are being digitized, complete, completed full text are also placed on the library website. Uh, after the uh, tragic events in Bosnia when the National Library in Sarajevo burned out, together with its precious funds, Bashagic collection of Muslim manuscripts in the University Library in Bratislava then became the only, only known intact library preserving Balkan Muslims, Muslim manuscripts. These circumstances enhance its international and regional value as well as cultural and historical significance, which is attested by the fact that it's included by the UNESCO in the memory of the world list in 1997. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Masaryshova, uh, for your for your lecture. And I think we can raise a couple of questions here, especially after seeing this uh, beautiful movie. I can imagine that Arabic script is rendered into various styles, which, uh, which are the fonts that, that we, we have seen, we used in the Bashagic collection. How, how are they called? Because I imagine there are various styles of fonts mm -hmm. in collection. What the, what the, uh, we have talking about the fonts, the Arabic script uh -huh. writing. Uh, the manuscripts are most commonly used fonts, Naski, Talik, Nastalik, Sikayat. And uh, here I would like to mention a calligraphic diploma for Muhammad Arashidi, the master of calligraphic art. Alva Fai confirms in the year of the Hijira, uh, 11, uh, 80, 18, uh, Anna Domini, uh, 17, six, that his pupil, Muhammad al-Rashidi, is able to see himself the books that which he has transcribed. The diploma is a beautiful example of calligraphy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Amesa Roshova. Now I would like to give floor to another speaker, Mr. Arno Frolik from Leiden. Okay. Can you hear me right like this? Yeah, okay. Um, mm -hmm. um, okay, maybe it's better to, yeah, to turn the light down uh, to see the, uh, the slides. Um, thank you very much for this beautiful presentation and film about the uh, uh, Middle Eastern collection in the University Library of Bratislava, a really beautiful collection, and it 
exemplary uh, collection of um, um, late Ottoman culture in, in, uh, in Bosnia. Uh, not only because of its, its, which includes the general works from, from Ottoman culture, but also local history and things by, by local authors, which makes it very special. So thank you very much. Um, um, well, as uh, I am Arnold Frohnick, I'm curator of the Middle East in uh, Oriental Manuscripts and Rare Printed Book at Leiden University Library. And I'm going to talk about the uh, collections um, at Leiden. Um, unusual place for a Middle Eastern collection, of course, Leiden in uh, northwestern Europe. Um, but there are reasons for the existence of this collection, which I will elaborate on in this presentation. Um, well, this, this morning I was dozing off on the plane, and suddenly I woke up uh, and I asked myself, what do uh, Spain, the Netherlands, and Slovakia have in common, apart from being uh, members of the European Union? It took me a while to find the right answer. Um, well, exactly 500 years ago, we were parts of the same huge Habsburg Empire. Um, and it is because of this empire that um, the Dutch found their independence, um, that we grew into the nation that we are today. Um, I'll start with a short history lesson. Uh, what do I do? Like this, yeah. Okay, this is just text, boring, but you have to uh, listen to me, otherwise you won't understand a bit of it. Um, in, in 1568, the Protestant Dutch revolted against um, Philip II, uh, King of Spain and Lord of the Netherlands. He was never King of the Netherlands, but he was Lord of the Netherlands. There were various reasons for this, um, religious reasons, of course, but also um, the initiative of King Philip to impose a 10% income tax, and that was not to be tolerated, of course. So the Dutch rose against the Spanish, and we were quite successful. But once we got our independence, we found ourselves wedged in between the major nations of Europe, the English, the French, the Spanish, and so forth, and so forth. There was only one esca escape that was um, uh, through the sea. And in our existence, we've always relied on diplomacy and maritime power. And based on the idea that your enemies' enemies are your friends, the Dutch Republic concluded treaties first with Morocco and then with the Ottoman Empire. And together with the English and the French, the Dutch broke the monopoly of Spain and Portugal on the trade routes to Asia and the Americas. And we made lots of money in this way. Um, in 1575, the leader of the resistance movement, uh, Prince William of Orange, founded the University of Leiden. You see his portrait on the left, very distinguished gentleman, and on the right, the first university library. And at the far end of the library, you see a chimney piece, and on the left, you see the same portrait. I don't have a pointer, but I hope you can see it. This is what the library was in 1610. It was based in a confiscated church. All churches were confiscated and either turned to Protestant Jews or turned into buildings for civic use. Also, the Central University building uh, is still is in a former Dominican monastery on the left. The building on the right is uh, slightly more modern. Uh, this is the building where I work um, uh, on a sunny autumn afternoon. Um, well, the, the collection is, is quite large. According to European standards, we have 6,000 Middle Eastern manuscripts, volumes, and 30,000 pre-1950 Middle Eastern printed books. So it's a fairly large collection. And I'm going to show how the Dutch Revolt and Spain and the Netherlands interacted to create this beautiful collection. And in order to show that also ugly things like war and violence and theft and whatever can lead to unexpected positive results. The gentleman on your left is Franciscus Raffalengius. He was from Antwerp and when, when Antwerp fell, to the Duke of Parma in 1585, he escaped to the Northern Netherlands, taking his collection with him. And one of these manuscripts was a Quran fragment, obviously from North Africa. I suppose you are familiar with this style. Now look, take a closer look at this manuscript. On the left, you see a close-up of the Wakfiya, or the document that testifies that it is the, um, the 
property of a mosque, in this case, the Friday Mosque, the Jami al Khutbah of Bizart in Tunisia. And it dates from 9 11 or 1505, the Christian era. Now, in 1535, Emperor Charles V sailed to Tunis and captured the city, and the city was ransacked, and many Qurans were taken as booty. Uh, on the right, you see a beautiful engraving of the battle before Tunis um, in 1535, and at the bottom, you see a poem in Spanish. I, I hope the screen is good enough for you to make out what it is. Okay, I'll give you some moments to reflect on it. So the fact that Tunis was ransacked led to the transport of this beautiful manuscript, first to Antwerp and then to Leiden. The first chair of Arabic was founded in 1613 by Thomas Erpenius, who learned Arabic in Paris from a Moroccan gentleman who had come as a diplomatic agent on behalf of the Moroccan Sultan to negotiate the restitution of some ships and their goods that have been taken by the King of France, formerly his ally. He was the first who published an Arabic grammar, well, not exactly the first, but he published an Arabic grammar in 1613 that would remain popular until the mid-19th century. Being keen on diplomacy, the Dutch Republic dispatched um, ambassadors to the Ottoman Empire. The first went in 1613, Cornelis Hager and several, and, and many successors, of course, and in the mid 17th century, there was a Dutch ambassador of German descent, Levinus Weiner, who had studied Oriental languages at Leiden. And, well, in his leisure time, he collected about a thousand Middle Eastern manuscripts, which were sent to Leiden after his death in 1665. So in this case, diplomacy and trade led to uh, this beautiful collection, which is right now at Leiden. And this is a beautiful engraving of Istanbul with the Topkapı Sarayı, the Hagia Sophia, and the Blue Mosque. It's, I hope you recognize it. Unexpectedly, um, well, expectedly, I should say, uh, you find many treasures in this collection because um, Istanbul was the staple market of the manuscript trade. A century earlier, the Turks had taken possession of almost the entire Middle East, and thousands and thousands of manuscripts were taken from libraries in Cairo, Damascus, and other places, and taken to Istanbul, where they, were, um, they came up for sale. And the manuscript on, on the left is a very rare and beautiful example. It is the unique manuscript of the Tawq al-Hamama, or Ring of the Dove, by um, Ibn Hazm. Um, as the specialist, uh, specialists among you will uh, see that it is not a North African manuscript, or Andalusian manuscript. The author came from, from um, Andalusia and he lived in the early 11th century. No, this, this manuscript was made in the third, 14th century and was made in Syria. So it was part of this collection, picked up in Istanbul in the mid-17th century and after the death of Levin Eswana taken to Leiden. It's a beautiful book. It's about the history of love and the phenomenon of love. It's not about sex. It's not a sexual handbook. It's a book on the phenomenon of love. It's a book about psychology. What do you experience when you are in love? What do you do about it? What do you, how do you deal with people who are envious? And so forth and so forth. Interlaced, interspersed with many beautiful fragments of poetry. And this book was translated into many languages. And there is a beautiful Spanish translation by Emilio Garcia Gomez with a foreword by uh, Jose Ortega y Gasset. And these are, of course, two towering figures in the intellectual life of 20th century Spain. Um, of course, uh, Garcia Gomez alongside with Father Pareja and uh, Miguel Asim Palacios, uh, the, 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 enormously important figures in Arabic and Islamic studies in Spain. I included a picture of uh, Garcia Gomez at the bottom. Well, the manuscripts may look very dreary and un unimportant, but we also have very colorful examples of, uh, from the same Levinas Varna collection, as you can see. Next to diplomacy in trade, there is the phenomenon of 19th century mercantile industrial expansion of Western Europe, of course, with um, the, the 
industrial economic progress, we built up enormous um, financial power, political power, which enabled us to gain influence in the Middle East. It's not only colonialism, it's also the buying power of 19th century Europe. Um, and this found its expression in the world exhibitions, for instance, the one in Amsterdam in 1883. To this, well, there is a little picture on the right how it looked like. It was built in a kind of, um, organized in a kind of crystal palace like the one in London and also burned down like the one in London eventually. But to this exhibition came a, a gentleman from Cairo, a scholar bookseller called Amin bin Hassan al Madani. And as his name will inform you, he came from Medina um, in the Arabian Peninsula. And he brought um, with him a collection of 600 Arabic manuscripts, and he was hoping to find a buyer for, this, for these manuscripts. And eventually he was successful after f and spending the whole summer in the blazing heat under the glass uh, greenhouse of the uh, Crystal Palace. Um, the books were first sold to Brill and then to Leiden University, where they still are. One example from this collection, for instance, is a set of treatises by Mohammed bin Abdel Wahhab, a Najdi, the founder of the Wahhabi Islamic movement, which is still very influential, uh, I should say, even uh, until this very day. And this particular manuscript is in the hand of the scholar himself. It's a really precious position. Deeply influential work, which still influences modern day Islam and the more um, traditional, I should say, uh, radical side of uh, present day Islam. Colonialism also plays a part. Um, the Netherlands never had colonial possessions in the Middle East, unlike France or England, but we did have colonial possessions in Indonesia. So this implied that the Dutch were responsible for the Indonesian pilgrims who went on Hajj, on the Islamic pilgrimage to Mecca. And because the Dutch government was worried about radical tendencies among the Indonesian pilgrims, they sent someone to monitor the movements of these pilgrims. And his name was Christian Snukhagornje, an unpronounceable name, of course, but he is the Netherlands' foremost Islamic scholar, Islam scholar, even venerated or um, cordially hated until the very, this very day. He went to Jeddah in 1884, and the, the year after he went to Mecca. He first he converted to Islam, officially converted to Islam, and stayed there in the holy city for about six months. And he collected photographs, documents, letters, some manuscripts, not too many, and many, many objects of daily use. Here you see a picture of the Kaaba as it was in 1885 let's say, and, and well, you know how it looks today, how much it has changed, and this is a very nice record of how it looked uh, more than a century ago. Um, Christian Snukahorny did not take the pictures himself, he brought the camera, of course, from Europe, a very big, huge thing, uh, on which he spent, spent about half of his government grant, um, but he, uh, during um, his efforts to make pictures, he, he solicited and obtained the help from a local doctor. Um, Abdel Ghaffar, uh, uh, a local doctor who greatly helped him, but whose name, of course, was subsequently forgotten. Um, well, I hope I've given the impression, some sort of impression, of what our collection looks like. Um, but, well, the element I would like to, to um, elaborate on, if, if you look so, is what is the position of Islamic heritage in a European library? So, I, that's a, is there something? Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rolik, for your exhaustive and in-depth you know, presentation. Perhaps too long. Uh, I, uh, I have to say, I really enjoyed it. And you touched briefly the, the point of certain antagonism between what we call Orient and Occident, or yes. perception of the travels of these collections that can be either perceived as a cultural theft or some sort of uh, cultural enrichment. Could you please tell us more? How, how do you perceive these y things? Yes, yeah, yeah, okay. Of course, we are very proud to have these collections, uh, beautiful Islamic manuscripts, but they were not made for us. They were made in a different cultural and political context. Um, they were intended to remain there, and yet they were taken away and brought to Europe, uh, like many other collections in Paris, in London, Berlin, and elsewhere, Bratislava, of course. And so this means sometimes they were taken by force, sometimes by, by purchase, uh, as in the Bratislava case. Some, and well, many, many, many ways the, these manuscripts came to us, but still it is a foreign 
heritage coming from a culture which is not ours. So um, I really think we have to be, we have to respect the sensitivities of these collections that we do own a collection that is in cultural terms, it does not belong to us, which gives us an extra responsibility to keep them for our users, uh, to, to keep this heritage, to preserve it for mankind. And that is perhaps the best we can do. Uh, thank you very much. I would just like to draw the attention, as you mentioned, uh, preserving and conserving the manuscript because we briefly touched the subject with uh, Mrs. Uh, Mesaroshova lecture. How are the manuscripts preserved in Netherlands? How are being taken care of? Yeah, well, it, it all depends on specialization. Uh, of course, we do have conservators, we do have paper restorers and so forth. We, at, at the library where I work, we have a full-time conservator, Karin Schreper, um, who specializes in Islamic manuscripts. And um, a couple of years back, she presented her doctoral thesis on Islamic book binding. So she really is a specialist and she, she knows how to, how to deal with this kind of manuscripts. But the problem is, of course, is that standards and, um, well, um, standards keep changing all the time. We have a beautiful Latin Arabic dictionary from the 11th century from Toledo, uh, which was laminated in the 1970s. And that is, of course, it was um, uh, pasted between layers of fiber, silk fiber. And it looks very stiff and becomes very brittle. And the problem is it is not reversible. So it was restored with the best of intentions, but now, it, well, so we would, we, this, these days we, we would never do it in the same way we did it in the 1970s. So you have to, 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 to be careful about this and see what you do with them. You really have to be careful. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Frolik. Now I would like to give floor to <coughs> Mrs. Nuria Martinez de Castilla and she will have her lecture in uh, Spanish. You have the floor, Nuria. Thank you. Aprovechando que estoy en casa, voy a utilizar también el idioma de casa. Eh, y eh, me encanta hablar después de. I love talking after uh, Professor Brolic because I'm going to be talking about the collection from San Lorenzo del Escorial. I'm not going to talk about the manuscripts in themselves. I'm going to be talking more about the history of this collection and how these manuscripts um, ended up in our hands and in the line of what uh, Mr. Uh, Rolik has presented, the history of the Arabic manuscripts of the Escorial coincides with the history of the monastery in itself in 1584. This is the time of Philip II, and he knew that he wanted to have a library near the palace, uh, away from the university uh, circles of Alcala or Salamanca, even if his uh, counselors had recommended him to uh, have a library near those places. This is how, at the beginning, he decided to uh, create this library under the care of the Hieronymite monks in San Lorenzo del Escorial, a magical, isolated and silent place in 70 kilometers from Madrid. The king, Philip II, was personally interested in the project of a library and through a group of scholars and ambassadors he managed to locate and buy uh, books and manuscripts from all Europe, uh, from uh, libraries, cathedrals, uh, monastery libraries and archives from the Inquisition. This idea reflected perfectly the spirit of the 16th century uh, Europe that included not only uh, codices in Arabic, Persian, and Turkish, but also manuscripts and prints in Hebrew, Latin, Greek, Spanish, Italian, French, Catalan, and Portuguese. It seemed impossible to think that in those days there were manuscripts written in Arabic or Hebrew, taking into consideration that we're talking about 1492, the uh, expelling of the Jews 
the false uh, conversions uh, into Christianity and the prohibition of the use of Arabic uh, from 1567 onwards without forgetting the burning of Arabic manuscripts uh, in the public squares, especially during the times of Cardinal Cisneros. As I mentioned, uh, the king was very interested in the knowledge conveyed by these Arabic manuscripts. Even one of his counselors, Alonso del Castillo, worked, who worked for the library, uh, tried to seek for uh, these volumes uh, in the uh, archives of the Inquis Inquisition, trying to uh, choose the most interesting ones for the Royal Library. In 1576, uh, there's an inventory that mentions 67 Arabic manuscripts, and they are mentioned as spoils of war, specifically. How did these end up in the library? Through different uh, channels. On one hand, we have the spoils of war as the manuscripts that were taken by Charles V during the expedition to, to Tunisia in 1535 or in during the Battle of Lepanto in 1571. We have manuscripts of these battles in El Escorial, and we also have manuscripts that come from previous collections and that were purchased by the king, as, for example, the uh, libraries of uh, Diego Hurtado de Mendoza with 256 Arabic manuscripts, or Benito Arias Montano. Some copies of these Arabic manuscripts um, seem to have been produced in the Iberian Peninsula, but they're not very old. According to Braulio Justil Calabozo, the number of uh, Arabic manuscripts kept in the library in uh, 16,000 uh, was amounted to more or less 500 manuscripts. The Arabic manuscripts that integrated this first uh, collection was not very important uh, in quantity, but uh, the bulk of the collection arrived later during the uh, kingdom of the heir of Philip II, with Philip III. This king was known for having expelled the Moorish, the last Muslims in Spain during the 17th century. And paradoxically, he was responsible for the uh, inclusion of the most significant Arabic manuscripts, uh, turning itself into the most important uh, collection. In May 1612, the Moroccan Sultan, Mulai Saidan, one of the uh, sons of Al-Mansur, was in facing an uprising in the uh, central area of his kingdom. The situation was so tense that he had to flee to Marrakesh, and then he tried to, he had the intention of going to Agadir, um, where he could find support. In Safi, he uh, sailed two boats, one French, one Dutch, and he loaded all his belongings in them, among others, the library that he had inherited from his father. In the French uh, uh, ship that was uh, captained by Jean-Philippe de Castellan, was called Notre-Dame de la Garde. Uh, he was in charge of taking jewels and other belongings together with the library funds. Both boats arrived safe and sound to Agadir, and Castellan expected to receive 3,000 ducats uh, as payment for the transport. But after a few days in Agadir, he realized that he was not going to receive uh, that quantity, and he decided to set sail uh, to Marseille, Marseille. But during his journey, Notre Dame de la Garde, the ship was persecuted and finally captured by three Spanish ships. In this way, the library of the Moroccan Sultan Moulay Saidan ended up uh, forming part of the library of uh, Spanish King Philip III. The uh, different uh, sources of the 17th century 
talk of around 3,000 to 4,000 manuscripts. Uh, probably the second figure is more accurate. The incorporation of this collection into the El Escorial uh, Library turned it into the most uh, important, uh, the biggest European one, um, the collection uh, was one of the most important ones, as, uh, as I said, uh, Arabic funds of the library of the University of Leiden, one of the most important ones from the uh, first quarter of the 17th century, uh, had more or less 300 copies. Castellan, uh, the captain of the boat, had been appointed French consul in Morocco, and he became an official agent of the French king. On the other hand, France and Spain were at peace, and considering that uh, Spain had captured a Fre uh, French boat, that was a clear breach of international law. But this is uh, the Western interpretation. As Robert Jones mentioned, there's a different interpretation according to Moroccan sources. There's a brief uh, passage mentioned by uh, Dutch Orientalist uh, Epenius, who said that a Numidian betrayed the Sultan and gave the information to the Spaniards. So in this case, Maybe this would be a premeditated attack uh, with the objective of capturing this specific library. And we accept this hypothesis. This would be an exceptional case in which the looting of the books would be the objective of the attack in itself and not a collateral uh, damage, uh, not uh, just a collateral damage of uh, this attack. It would be uh, the objective in itself. In any case, it seems that uh, Sultan Mulai Zaidan sent a delegate to the United Provinces, uh, the name of the Netherlands in those days, to be able to uh, get support and convince the French king. Uh, to support him against Spain and to um, get the library uh, uh, back to Moroccan territory. The French did not accept this collaboration. In 1617, uh, the Moroccan embassy in Istanbul explained the situation to the uh, Grand Vizier, waiting uh, for and uh, explained the whole history, and, and they waited for an answer that never arrived. According to Spanish sources, Moulay Sadan offered Philip III an important quantity of money to be able to uh, return this uh, library to Morocco. But the king said that in that case he would have to free all the Christian slaves that existed in Morocco. So uh, this was uh, this request was denied, and uh, Moulay Sadan could never uh, recover those books. In 1651, after a request of uh, Mul the son of Moulay Saidan, the Duke of Medici Medicianelli recommended uh, Philip IV to uh, return the books to Morocco. But the State Council uh, denied this possibility. In 1766, a Moroccan representative was able to visit the library of El Escorial, and he took with him some manuscripts to Morocco. Among them, the famous uh, Quran of Lepanto, um, the, which, uh, the, whose whereabouts are currently unknown. The diplomatic and cultural importance of this collection is still uh, very significant. In 2008, the Spanish kings uh, visited the library of Alexandria and they donated a microfilmed copy of the Arabic manuscripts of El Escorial. At the same time, together with Muhammad uh, VI, uh, Juan Carlos I, the king of Spain, uh, delivered a copy of these uh, codices uh, to the National Library of Morocco. In any case, for historians, the capture of the Mulai Zaidan Library has a positive outcome. It is one of the few Islamic libraries that have uh, remained undamaged until nowadays. 
with the Serian library uh, that exists in El Escorial, we can more or less know what the collection was like in 1612, because it has been kept, so to speak, mummified, and we cannot say the same things of other Arabic libraries. The majority of the collections have been scattered, and very few have uh, reached uh, our current days, and they also date from the 16th and 18th century. It is also very difficult to determine uh, each, the period of each collection unless there is a specific catalogue to indicate it. This is not the case of the Sadian uh, Library. It has been um, kept practically intact, also considering that from 1712 onwards the new acquisitions went to the new National Library of Madrid and not to the Royal Library of El Escorial. But we can mention um, the fire that affected uh, the monastery of uh, El Escorial in uh, seven, 1671. A lot of manuscripts, prints, Arabic, uh, Latin, Greek were uh, burnt by this fire despite the efforts of the monks to protect them from the flames. As a consequence of these, a lot of, uh, and for other con preservation reasons, a lot of these um, the bindings of these codices w uh, were substituted by um, different ones. Nearly 2,000 Arabic manuscripts are preserved nowadays in El Escorial, and they can uh, bring a lot of information with regard to intellectual material uh, subjects, uh, opening new uh, ways of work. It is an essential tool for new researchers, and it has uh, remained practically intact for four centuries. Uh, Nuria, for your presentation. Nuria, I uh, would like to ask you a question. Como en las épocas después de conversiones forzadas y expulsión, ¿Qué tipo? Uno se pregunta, ¿qué tipo de lectores podían tener estos manuscritos? Um, the, uh, actually read those manuscripts were these monks or were they Arabists, etc. Well, in the 16th century in Spain, if we look into this time, this is an excellent question because in 1502, the forced conversion of Muslims into Christianity, the Spanish Muslims into Christendom. Um, the Arabic stopped being spoken, and from 1577, it's a language that is totally forbidden officially. There's uh, manuscripts are burnt, ma Arab manuscripts are burnt by Cardinal Cisneros, and at the same time, uh, Arabic is being taught in universities in Salamanca, in Alcalá de Henares. And why is Arabic being taught? Well, the, the main goal was to translate the Bible. Knowing the Arabic language will allow to uh, know Hebrew better and therefore know the Bible better. The king knows and is the, his counselors tell them that the Arabic science is very important, the Arab science is very important and is going to be conveyed through the manuscripts. So he compiles them and who could read those manuscripts? Nobody. And there were very few people who could read them and uh, he was aware of that. And Arias Montano, he was a scholar and a counselor of the king and he tells the king that he shouldn't worry. He told him, he suggests him to gather the uh, most varied manuscripts from different authors with the, the most special manuscripts and unique manuscripts that you can find in Europe because even though today there might not be people who are capable of reading it, in the future there will be experts and this will be the most important library of all times. So at the beginning they were truly for the use of the um, Hieronymites, um, monks, but they were very aware of this lack of knowledge of Arabic language. 
to read this uh, manuscripts but they knew that at some point there would be people who would be able to read them and this would turn the library in an excellent library a great library I have another question we have talked about the preservation of manuscripts and um, I suppose that digital world has is having a certain impact in the use of manuscripts by researchers and I assume that uh, back in the year of the uh, fire we could have saved those manuscripts by scanning them. Um, do, do you think that there is any initiative of about this? Well, that would have been a, the dream of all our Arabists that there would have been a way of scanning or at least copying these manuscripts that were burned in the fire that were amounted probably to half of their collection. The, the, mm, we think that we might have lost about 2,000 manuscripts in the, in the fire. Nowadays, all manuscripts in the library have been digitalized. They are in micro files and this is the copy that was provided to the Alexandria Library and the Rabat um, University Library. They're not published online. You, we need to ask them for from the library. The Royal Palace Library has another copy of those manuscripts as well. And for the conservation preservation of those manuscripts, it's more than necessary to have a copy in a microfilm and a scanned copy, color copy with the highest quality. Also, uh, including indexing those manuscripts is, is very important to know what's inside of these manuscripts. Not everybody uh, speaks the language and not everybody has the time to go to the libraries and check those manuscripts in person. But sometimes we, somebody might be interested in a particular topic and the first tool is to uh, resource to catalogs that are very difficult to compile. Researchers take years to compile those catalogues and sometimes this work is not fully recognized. And um, However, this is an uh, essential tool. We are trying to make a new catalog of the El Escorial Library. The 17th, 18th and part of the 19th century have already been catalogued and we are trying to re-index them all. And there's an European project going on that started a few years ago. and. Uh, this was about a direct study of the uh, material part of this collection and we hope that this project will be fruitful in the coming years and it will provide us information about this collection in the coming years. Thank you very much, Nuria. It was great to hear you. Thank to all speakers that were presented uh, with us tonight. And I would also like to open the floor to, to public, the audience, if someone um, has a question. Is there any other question? No, well, thank you very much. Thank you for being here with us tonight. It was a um, thank you to all our speakers, and in particular to Casa Arabe for organizing this event with us tonight. Had also some fun and some deep knowledge of uh, Islamic manuscripts. Thank you very much.